Hi, I'm Zach Childs, and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today, our guest is Derek Wells. Hey. Welcome. Thanks, man. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Uh, you know, looking at the Billboard charts, I, I saw that you played on four of the top ten country albums this week. Wow, yeah, it's it's been a, been a crazy year. <laughs> well, let's let's back up a little bit. And uh, you were born in Nashville, Arkansas. I was born in Nashville, Arkansas. I tell everybody, uh, you know, from Nashville, which is true. <laughs> uh, my parents moved here though. Uh, I was not even a year old. I was about ten months old when they moved here to, okay. uh, to Nashville proper, Nashville, Tennessee. So yeah. Anyway, so I said I'm I'm from here. I, I grew up here. Um, now, and you also come from a musical family. So tell us a little bit about your uh, about your your parents and such. I do. Yeah. Born to lose. I I know. Uh, yeah. So my dad and my stepdad are both guitar players. Uh, my dad Kent Wells. Um, He's been Dolly Parton's band leader and guitar player for uh, 25 years, roughly, um, with some breaks where he did some other things. Uh, my stepdad, Mike Waldron, uh, was uh, Lee and Womack's band leader for a lot of years and now just kind of does the studio thing. Uh, and my mom's a great session singer and, and piano player and live stage. She's, you know, Worked with Patty Loveless and Rodney Crowell, and she's out with Christopher Cross right now. So yeah, definitely a musical family. Then my stepmom was a nurse. Yeah, she was the only one with any sense, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so with all that, were there just guitars around all the time, or how, how did you start playing? There were, uh, there were guitars, you know, everywhere, and um, you know, particularly, you know, when I was really young, when my mom and dad were still married, you know, they were both, you know, gigging musicians. Uh, they were always learning songs, you know, working on music at the, you know, writing charts, working on some gig they had coming up, you know, and uh, so I remember that. Um, but I, you know, for me, I caught the bug really late in life. I, I think there was a certain amount of like, you know, you never think what your parents do is cool. I was okay. maybe a little desensitized to it because it was so, you know, it wasn't a special thing to me. Music wasn't because it, it was going on all the time. You know, they were always working on something. And, and as they would tell you too, you know, it's like, I'd like to say that as a you know working musician, everything you do and you work on is great. But, you know, let's just say there was a lot of bad music being played around the house sometimes too. You know, you hear them in there learning some jive songs or whatever it you know it was and you got got to pay the bill they, oh yeah and they hey you know i'm a little skinny but they fed me for 18 years doing it you know and they uh but no they were awesome and um but man i knew uh it, you know every once in a while you know when i was like you know 9 10 11 i would kind of go pick up a guitar and kind of mess with it but um i was always too embarrassed to to like try to play because i for whatever reason, I was very aware of how good they were. And, um, you know, I remember, you know, hanging around with, you know, their friends and peers, you know, other musician guys and being a kid and, you know, them telling you like, man, your dad is so good or, you know, your mom is so good or Mike, so, man, we love, you know. And um, so, you know, I might be tinkering around with something and my dad would come in and it's like, hey, man, do you want me to do it? And I'd go, no, 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 and I'd put it down and walk away because it, it embarrassed me, especially to play loud or something. You know, my dad sometimes would be like, hey, you want to plug in an amp? I'm like, no, uh -uh, I'm, I'm awful. No, no, you know. And uh, and I would always tell him, too, you know, when I got to be in high school and everything, you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to get a real job. I'm not going to do what you got. You know, that's crazy what you guys do. Um, but when I was about... 16, uh, my cousin was a drummer, and he wanted me to be in a band with him in his basement, which, you know, at that age, being in a band meant you play songs in his basement. There, we didn't have gigs or anything, you know, right. it was just a couple other dudes. And, and um, so I asked my dad if I could take, you know, uh, do you have an amp and a guitar I can take? And, and I did, and I mean, we were terrible. I, in a very literal sense, I could not play guitar. I mean, I, I could not play. I didn't know core. I didn't know anything. And, uh, but man, the bug kind of hit me. And I, I went off to college, um, uh, and uh, was a print journalism major at Western Kentucky for for about a year. And it was in that time, I had, I had taken a guitar. I'd asked my dad if I could take a guitar up to college with me. I said, do you have something laying around that you wouldn't miss that I could take and just like play in my dorm room or something? It's like, yeah, take this thing. And, and uh, that was like, 
something happened in that, you know, couple semesters of me just sitting there playing, um, playing songs all the time, and I got the fever, man. I mean, that, that was it. I was like, okay, I, I want to do this. You know, I, I, I want to do this. You know, and I came home, and of course, my parents were like, "This is a terrible idea." You know, they're like, "This is too. You're getting too late to start." You know, people that do this, you know, they've been playing. You know, my dad, he'd been playing since he was, you know, six years old. He used to do like flat picking competitions in, you know, Arkansas and all this stuff. My stepdad Mike had gone, he'd played since he was a kid too, and he had gone to GIT and done the LA thing. And yeah, they were all just kind of like, oh. And I, I think in hindsight, they probably, some of their hesitation was they maybe thought, well, college didn't work out for him, and he probably thinks this is just easy. Like he can just slide into this. And of course, they knew, you know, that's not the case. It's but. difficult. Very hard, and um, but that wasn't it. I, like I said, I had a very real understanding of how good you needed to be, and I knew I wasn't. You know, I was ready to like start working and just practice, and you know, after like six months of being holed up in my dad's basement all the time, and him, I think him and mom kind of talking. They're like, "Man, he, I, I think he's kind of serious. <laughs> I think he's going to try to do this." And then, it, then they kind of slowly started. You know, you should go buy a number system book. You know, like, what is that? You know, I, you know, I tell, you know, kind of explained it to him. You know, those things were always writing. It's the charts, you know. So they, they slowly got on board, and you know, one thing led to another. But that was the. I definitely took the long way around. Yeah. I think often what would have, you know, man, if I'd have known earlier, you know, and if I had gone to like somewhere like Belmont or something, you know, what what life would have looked like or how things would have worked out differently, but. Um, I ended up in a good spot regardless, you know. Absolutely. So, yeah. so, so what was your first gig with a major artist? Uh, wow. Well, <laughs> that, I guess a major is debatable. Uh, On a major label. Okay, well, yeah, I can trace it back. You know, I can trace everything back to one gig, and it's, it's really funny. Is um, uh, I, had, I was waiting tables at the old cooker yes. in, uh, in Green Hills. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a girl songwriter friend of mine that I had met that I had started playing acoustic guitar for at like some writers' rounds. She didn't play very well, and you know she knew I played, but I mean I was not a working musician by any stretch of the imagination. And um, I played around with her, and at the end of the round, this guy comes up to me and's like, "Hey, man, uh, you know I'm, I'm Dave, and uh, he played. He had a gig playing guitar for an artist named Tammy Cochran." That was, okay. that was back on, uh, she was on Universal at the time. She had like one single called Angels in Waiting was her like, you know, top 10 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, he was like, I've got a gig with her in two days. And he's like, uh, he's like, I can't do it. I have asked every guitar player I know. And he's like, would you do it? Can you do, do you want to do it? You know, and he must have really been at, it, you know, wit's end. And I was like, uh, sure. And he's like, okay, you know, here's my address. Come by tomorrow. I've got the whole show on a CD. I'll give it to you. You know, bus calls at, you know, 7 a.m. on Friday. I was like, okay. So I went by, you know, so I go at this dude's house over down off Music Row and get the things and I get the CD. And I remember my parents both telling me, they were like, do not try to memorize this music. It's too much music. Just write the charts. If you need help, we can help you write the charts. Like, do not try to memorize it all. And so I, I listened to him, and I wrote out charts for everything. I'd been kind of slowly working on the whole thing. And I did it, and I, I showed up, and I went out, and um, the, that band leader was kind of like, uh, you know, we did the show, and, it, and I was passable. And uh, the band leader was like, hey, man, you know, between me and you, you know, she, Timmy's about to lose her deal. There's a, been a big merger over at Universal, and he, he's like, she's only got about eight shows left this year. Do you want to just do them all? And I was like, yeah, you know, that'd be great, you know. And um, after about the fourth gig, her bass player was playing for another artist named Kelly Coffee that was on the same label that was like the exact same deal. And he's like, hey, man, I'm playing with this girl, Kelly. Um, she had had a single called Dance With My Father. It was her thing. And, and uh, he was like... Uh, I've been doing both of these gigs. There's not a lot of work, and her guitar player just left. I mean, do you want to do that gig too? You know, she's she's got about 12 shows left this year, and I'm like, and he's like, and they both, you can do them both because they're working out. And I was like, sure, man, I'll do that. You know, and the steel player from Kelly's gig left to go work for a guy named Josh Turner, and 
about four months later, that guy called me and said, hey, I'm playing for this Josh guy. He's got the Lone Buck Train song and his guitar player just left. So, you know, they're doing auditions. Can I put your name in for the audition? He's like, I think you'd fit in. You know, he'll like you and you're young and everything. And I was like, sure. So I went and auditioned and, and got the gig for Josh, which is really, the, you know, I was with Josh for five years and that was my, that was really my, you know, I think of that as my first big gig, but there were a couple, you know, yeah. other artists before that that kind of helped me get there so but you can trace it all back to one round at, at Bailey's down on Broadway or I was playing acoustic you know kind of funny so I, the now the other gigs you got from referrals yeah but then with with Josh you had to you had to try out had to audition yeah there was nine guys that auditioned oh. um, that that day um, and I, I was the first one <laughs> in the morning I don't know how that worked out uh, and you know, auditions are tricky, man. It's, uh, uh, I haven't done many, but uh, you know, that was one. And uh, you know, no matter how good or bad you play, they all kind of look at you and smile at the end and go, hey, thanks for coming, man, we'll call you. And uh, you know, it, that's kind of the thing. And, uh, uh, but man, yeah, they, they called me back and, and uh, you know, Josh had, uh, he just kind of like, you know, he like my, the steel player had the instinct. He just kind of got a good feel for me. He thought I would fit, fit. You know, I mean, obviously I'd played the songs like the record, but he thought, you know, hey, this guy's gonna fit in with everybody on the bus. And he, you know, I think that was as big a deal to him as anything. You know, people don't realize that you spend so much more time hanging out than oh, actually playing music. Man, so if, I, if absolutely. So if you're not, you know, fun to be around. Then it doesn't matter how good of a player you are, you're going to get dropped and they're going to find somebody else. That is exactly right, man. It's like, you, you know, you got to be a good hang because, I mean, you play, you know, at best, 90 minutes of your day is playing music, you know, and you got to be, I mean, you have to be passable. I mean, there's definitely guys that aren't cutting it. That's that's a different story. But, yeah, it doesn't matter if you, you know, you'd fire Derek Trucks from your band if, you know, if he wasn't fun to be around. You, know, you just, you would, you know, so... Uh, it is, it's a big, big deal, you know, and just, and just simple adult etiquette, being on time, being dependable, learning the song, I mean, that kind of stuff, they don't want to have to babysit you, you know, you're not, it is a job, you know, the road thing, I talk to people about a lot, especially some of the younger kids at Belmont and stuff talking about road gigs, and it's like, look, it is a great job, and, you know, you, you, you know, you borderline on fame on some of these things and maybe some people will treat you differently and whatever and you can make good money and those, all those things. But it is a job, you know, like your boss will make requests of you. They're not out of line to ask you to change something you're doing or need you to be at this place at this time or not want to argue with you about every single thing that they want to do, you know. It's like you, you're there to, you know, fulfill a service to them that's that's it and if you you know if you're not going to do that there's plenty of other people that will happily show up and play guitar with a smile <laughs> so so with uh, with Josh uh, were you uh, were you just given the did you just go out and buy the albums and, and and learn the songs or like how did you go about learning the songs I know I know in some cases they'll actually give tracks where where the guitar parts are isolated and such yeah right um well so when I got the Josh gig um, he was still pretty new act he the the, the long black train had been his, like his one single mm -hmm. and he was working on a second record which we now know it would was the your man record which ended up being a big career record for him but that was not out yet and the band was really small it was um, it was bass drums um, the steel player Josh played acoustic and then me on electric and that was it and his record has you know at the time that record had the long black train record had you know fiddle and dobro and second guitar parts and all this stuff so um, they did give me uh, a live recording of the of the shows they had been doing with the old guitar player and to kind of show me what parts he was covering because between him and the steel player they had kind of had to try to divvy up some of the load you know oh hey the back half of this solo on this song's a fiddle solo well which one of us should take you know that kind of stuff um, and so that was really helpful because I could have learned the record top to bottom and it still might not have been the best you know hybrid part so to speak to right. play in the live setting and the guy he had had playing guitar for him was really good before 
um, this guy named Clint Chandler that still to this day plays for Lady Annabellum. Great, great guitar player. And you know the board tapes they gave me with Clint, you know he he sounded awesome. And um, but that was super helpful, you know. Um, and I did later, you know, later I did some other gigs where they supplied stems, and but a lot of times those were in the larger bands where everyone could cover a part. You know, there may be two electric players and they would send you the left and right, so to speak. And, you know, you play this and you play this. And on the harmonies, you're the guy that takes this high one and you're the guy that takes this low one. And they would have it all separated out. And so I've, I've been a part of both, both ways. But for Josh particularly, I just kind of lived with that live CD they gave me first. Um, but then shortly thereafter... Really, by the time we got to the second record, when Your Man was kind of blowing up and that single and his, the gigs were getting better and there was some more money and stuff, and we added a fiddle player, we added some you know, keys, and we added a few other things. And then I was able to, to kind of zero in a little more on exactly what was happening on just electric guitar on the records instead of trying to fill space, you know. And, and, um, and then from then on out, that's how I always learned um, I would just, you know, get the records. We, didn't, we never got stems with Josh. That wasn't part of the... Part of the deal, um, but whenever it was a new record, you know, just sit down, listen over and over, wear out that rewind button, you know. <laughs> so, were, were you pretty much asked to replicate exactly what was played? Yeah, Josh wanted it like the record as much as he could every night, especially as the band got bigger. Once we could cover everything, that was really how he liked it, you know. He same way. So, you know, tones, playing, and, and so this was, uh, I guess, Brent Rowan and Brent Mason were mainly the guitar players? Yeah, it was, ones. yeah. It was uh, Brent Mason on the first one, the Long Black Train record, and then really it was Brent Rowan uh, for the next couple records. Uh, okay. Just him, the only, he was the only electric player, really. Um, uh, yeah, so just covering that kind of stuff. And I remember I, I called Brent Rowan at one point and picked his brain about a couple of things. He was really gracious. Very nice. Um, really nice guy and, and just kind of said, you know, like, I remember having a question about some tremolo stuff he was using, you know. I'm like, yeah, and he was really gracious, really helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he did great work on, the, on that stuff, you know. And then eventually we got to, but even with that, you know, n nowadays in recording, modern recordings, it's almost unheard of for an electric guitar player to only play one part on a track. You know, it's just... It's not, it just doesn't happen, you know. And um, while Brent stuff wasn't always like two distinct parts interweaving or stuff, he was so smart at like layering simple lines, like doubling something he'd already played with a baritone and, it, you know, making it more impactful and that kind of stuff. And eventually as the Josh production got bigger and bigger and we were doing it, we eventually moved to a situation where we were running auxiliary tracks where... You know, uh, like Josh had a song, a Firecracker, that had a big signature, and it was doubled with a baritone. So we would put the baritone on a track, kind of tucked underneath me, and I would just play the regular guitar part. You know that. So we did some of that kind of stuff later on towards the end. Um, uh, say towards the end, meaning when I before I left. You know, but um, yeah, that that process kind of always evolved. It was always like. What can we cover here? What can we not? You know, we got this many guys on stage, but realistically, you know, there's still more tracks than guys on stage. So how do we make the best of it without trying to use? And we tried to use very minimal tracks. We just, we had a big band and, you know, we tried to cover as much as we could. But, you know, right. if, it, if we felt like it was really integral to the, the song, you know, if it was a big string patch on a ballad or something, we'd kind of have that kind of stuff. But. So before we get into you know, kind of the, the session thing, so yeah. what were some important lessons that you learned you know, working with Josh? Man, uh, well, you know, I'll tell you, first and foremost, and there may be varying opinions on this, but because Josh liked, liked us to play the record the same way every night, man, I I had just burned that record into my I mean all of every time we'd get a new thing you know I mean I would just uh, you know I, I really would never quit revisiting it until we had the next one I mean I was constantly um, going back and um, you know just trying to get the subtleties of everything and man the thing about playing. When you get that, when you get something like that, it's so inside your brain, and I mean, you can play it in your sleep. 
the cool thing is, is man, you, you never really have a bad show. You know, I mean, we've all seen live bands that kind of shoot from the hip and when they're on, it's amazing. But I've seen some train wrecks too, you know, and, um, for me, that was a philosophy I, I kind of took into every other gig that I've ever done really since then was just kind of like know it so well that like even if you're having an off night, you're still not going to play like a wrong note. You know, like it's so automatic that you're not going to screw up because there's when you get on a big, especially when you get on a big production, there's so much other things to worry about, like so many other things I should say rather. I mean, there's you know, you, you, the stage is pitch black and you're trying to get to a point in this other, you know, before the song starts where you can, you know, be under this light that they need you to stand under and, you know, and, uh, you know, trying to, you know, just make sure you're in tune. I mean, all these things, you know, that, that are, you know, outside of just trying to play. Oh, and oh yeah, I got to play guitar too, you know, and listening for counts and making sure you don't miss cues and just being aware, stage awareness in general. I was the band leader too, so... Part of the thing for me too was in between songs, surveying the stage and making sure that the drummer wasn't about to count off a song that the banjo player started when he didn't have his banjo on yet and stuff like that, you know? And so it's like, there's so many other plates spinning. If you can have your your parts just on automatic, like know them backwards and forwards, man, it it made for a much more enjoyable Cause man, you don't you don't want to go out and bomb in front of twenty thousand people or whatever, you know. And uh, and uh, the whole band was was that we kind of all took that philosophy of like man, just know it, just know it. And so we we never unless there was some kind of technical thing, we never had like a bad show because it you know it was. And then if, if someone was really feeling it, you might step out a little bit in certain places that night if you're feeling great, and then that's awesome. But if you knew you <laughs> didn't have it that night, you were going to still play every note right because it was just so unautomatic. And then when the high pressure situations come up too, all of a sudden you got to go play, you know, Tonight Show, Jay Leno. And man, I'll tell you, man, you may not think you're going to be nervous, but first time you do like that and they start counting you off and you, or when you go play David Letterman and it's 50 degrees in the studio yeah. and your hands are freezing cold because, you know, uh, you're going to be happy that you know that solo in your sleep because there's so much other stuff going on and you got cameras coming in your face out of the corner of your eye, you know, it's, so that was the biggest thing I, I definitely learned was like, no, if you're on a gig like that, that's your job. Like, that's what you're being paid to do. Learn the, st learn it, like just know it like the back of your hand, which seems simple to me, but man, I've seen plenty of guys think they know the gig until they get out there on the gig. <laughs> Coming up in the next episode of the True Tone Lounge, we talk to Derek about quitting the road and breaking into the world of sessions. That's when I just stayed in, I just refused to, to take a full-time road gig, you know, and I got called about a few other things and, cause, you know, and uh, I just had to turn them down, even though the money was real tempting. And I mean, I was not making a lot of money doing sessions. I, you know, I was barely scraping by.